kore hi te manu taki mai te ata ka ao ka ao ka ao tia te he mauriora. Tēnā koutou i ngā iwi kua hui mai nei tine ata ki te kōrero i ngā kaupapa whakahirahira. Nau mai, haere mai, tēnei te mihu aroha ki a koutou katoa. He uri au nō te tai tokerau, ko te rarua te iwi ko ngai tūpoto ki Motukaraka te hapū, ko Moira Kloni Toko Ingoa. I'm Moira, I'm Project Lead for Te Ngākau Kahukura, and I'm so happy to welcome you here today for the first in our Takutapui and Rainbow webinar series for Aotearoa's youth sector. Before I introduce our two speakers this morning, I just wanted to say a little bit about Te Ngākau Kahukura and what we're all about. So, Te Ngākau Kahukura is a national initiative that sits in partnership between Rainbow Communities and Aratayohi, which is the national peak body for the youth sector. We really want Takatapui and Rainbow Young People in Aotearoa to be safe, to be valued, to feel like they belong in all the spaces where they live, learn and access healthcare and social support. We don't provide frontline services for young people, we work at more of a systems change level. So we're working with people like political decision makers, like funders, researchers, training providers, um, youth services to help them understand rainbow populations and issues and to figure out what that looks like in their context to work out how they can do the work. We were really privileged to work with Dr Elizabeth Kirikire to find our name, Te Ngāko Kahugera, and she also gave us a whakatauki that speaks to our work which is up on the screen now, so kia puawai, me puawai. In order for our rainbow young people to flourish and thrive, really we need to grow, we need to do the work. So a lot of our work with Te Ngāka Kahukura is educating and advising and coaching and helping people who work with young people to understand what it means to respect and manaki the rainbow young people that they work with. Uh, we also work really closely with the rainbow support sector with Inside Out, Te Whana Whana Rainbow Youth, um, Qtopia, to work out how we can support their mahi and strengthen their capacity. So that's us, we've put together this free webinar series for anyone anyone and everyone who works with young people across Aotearoa to learn more about working with rainbow young people and we really want to get into it to sort of move past the 101 and go a little bit deeper. We might not cover off all the questions you have today, I'd really encourage you to check out our website, um, read some more and please do get in touch if you want to ask us about anything else after this. But for today if you have a question please pop it in the Q&A. Um, section that's the easiest way for us to see it and you're also welcome to use the chat if you want to introduce yourself and add, add anything just make sure that you have it set to uh, all panelists and attendees so that others can see it. We've also got uh, Jen Shields from Kitopia keeping an eye on the chat today. So let's get into it. <laughs> We're really privileged to have two amazing people with us today to share their whakaro and experiences. So I'll briefly introduce um, the two of them and then hand over to um, them to say anything else. Um, Siobhan Kahu Tumai is a Tukutapu mama living in Ōtautahi. Uh, she has whakapapa to multiple Waikato Tainui hapū. Siobhan studied a Bachelor of Arts in Cultural Studies and works in art and mental health and recently also studied some mahi with Inside Out. Um, in schools uh, across Ōtautahi and across Canterbury more generally, I think. Um, and Dr Elizabeth Kirikire is really well known these days as a Green MP and has given apologies in advance. You might have to disappear and go speak in the house <laughs> at some stage during this hour, but has been connected with rainbow activism and community mahi for years. We've worked together in lots of ways before. Um, she's founder and chair of Te Whana Whana Trust and completed a PhD on Takatapui identity and communities. Um, one of the things we work together on is the resource um, Takatapui, part of the Fano, and we'll share links to where you can find that online or order your own print copies. So, um, yeah, to start with, Kōrua, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, um, your, um, anything you want to share about your whakapapa, your identity, your mahi, and what does Takatapui mean to you? Um, maybe could I start with Elizabeth in case you need to run off? Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, i toutou koana, ngā mihi kua mihi a. 
it's funny because when we're in a location, we would normally acknowledge our uh, the mana whenua of that place. And when we're on air, then I think we must have to acknowledge all of our gods, our ancestors who are in the ether are surrounding us. So uh, lovely to see. Well, I actually can't see who's all here, but I know that you're there. <laughs> and whoever may watch this. Uh, kia ora, I'm Elizabeth. And I whakapapa to the Gisborne tribes of Tairawhiti, so Rongo Whakata, uh, Ngai Taumanuhiri, uh, but my main iwi that I grew up around Fano Akai Ngati Oni Oni and Te Aitanga Mahaki. And I guess for me, when I have worked for so long advocating for Takatapui, um, basically since I got learned that term from Ngahuia Te Awe Kotuku and her study and her work, that it's kind of, it's, it's my life. The, even here in Parliament, it's, I, I keep saying that I just do what I've always done, but now I have staff, I have access to resource, and that makes a massive, massive difference. I have access to unlimited travel funds. If you need me to come to your rohe to talk to you and uh, talk about these kaupapa, I'm up for it. For me, though, it's... It's about connection. It's connection with our takatapui ancestors. It's all of us who work together, uh, trying to make sure that across our rainbow communities that we are upholding te tiriti o waitangi and what that looks like. And so for many of us who are takatapui that we work with our tauiwi allies uh, across our communities, uh, it's about our elders and our people who live our culture, understanding what it means to change. I'm starting to get a lot of uh, requests right now for schools around the country who are struggling what to do in their whakapapa lines, not whakapapa lines, aroha mai, in their kapahaka lines for to uh, accommodate people who are uh, trans and non-binary and intersex. And so uh, Kevin, my co-leader for Tifana Fana, uh, and the, the whānau have discussed this issue and, and come up with some core principles and, and we're going to start visiting those schools and uh, just just have those conversations about what that looks like because it's real life and it's we have to make it, it's not just conceptual, it's not just in our community, how does this work in the whole world and and that's part of the role we, we must play in stepping up but also being really consistent in our languaging and in the messaging that we're putting out to people. It is a pleasure to be here with both of you. Uh, you're people I deeply, deeply love and respect. And I, uh, I, yeah, apologies if I zoom out. I'm going to leave my screen on. You'll be able to see me, see me in wearing my Speak Up uh, pink shirt in the Parliament, uh, giving a speech, and then I'll zoom back here again. So I'm just keeping an eye. Oh my God, they're already. I'm speech six, and they're up to speech two. So well other or or I might not at all things move very fast here so just to not let you know I'll sneak off and I'll come back so kia ora. Kia ora Elizabeth thank you so much for making the time for us this morning so good to have you here. Um, Siobhan can I hand over to you to um, share anything else you want to about yourself and tell us about what does Takatapui mean to you? I um, am Hiana Kurua um, thank you for your uh, beautiful kōrero. Um, thank you for having us, Moira and Elizabeth. It's always such a pleasure to see you. Um, wish I could give you a big hug. Um, <laughs> I hope that Parliament goes well today. <laughs> um, uh, kia ora koutou, um, ko tainui tukuiwi. Um, no whangarei au, um, Kei oto tahi toku kainga nai nei, um, ko Kai Hitchcock taku whaiaipo, um, ko Jamie Takutama, uh, ko Siobhan toku ingoa. Uh, so I work for oto tahi creative spaces. Um, we are a creative space for people um, experiencing mental distress uh, to come and do beautiful artwork. Um, so I'm an art support worker in those art sessions and I've also just started a role with Inside Out as the Waitaha Schools Coordinator. Um, so I'm really passionate about working with rangatahi uh, and also working with all aged people who experience um, 
I guess, marginalization in our kind of cis heteronormative col colonial patriarchal society that we have here in Aotearoa. But um, I always try and send her the understanding that everybody is on a learning journey. Um, and so being able to hold space for people to be on different paths and that learning journey is really important to me. Um, what takatapui means to me is being able to <clears throat> understand, oh, kaki te whaia, see you soon. <laughs> um, being takatapui is about being able to connect with your tupuna, being able to connect with your culture and understand that sexuality and gender is fluid and it's not the prescribed way that we've been taught that um you know can it, it doesn't hold space enough for the myriad of ways that our identities are in the world and um i'm really excited to be a part of inside out especially um because it means that i get to go into schools as this sort of fluffy fat brown wahine maori you know um and advocate for our rainbow communities um i really think that role modeling by older queer uh, rainbow folks is really important for our rangatahi and um i know that it's not always safe to be out and i know that it's not always safe for our young people and I really believe that the kaupapa, um, that all yeah, um, rainbow youth organizations hold um, is to provide safety for um, young people of all, you know, genders, ethnicities, etc. So I, um, obviously, he takatapu yaho. Um, I couldn't come out until a lot later in life, so... I was about 28 um, and I'd already been married for, to a cis -het what man um, for years and there were obviously moments where um, there was some really painful internal experiences for me um, but I think that because I grew up kind of quite conservative my family was quite conservative it wasn't safe for me and so coming to a place in my life where I was strong enough to come out um and then also having to change like a lot of my life um you know I kind of don't really want our young people to have to experience a good 20 years of having to pretend to be somebody else before they can start living their lives. So I guess that's why I do what I do is so that our young people can right from, you know, their youngest age that they can live their truth and live in their identity and know that there are definitely people out there who love them as they are. Bye. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, in, in terms of kind of making space, making safer space for Rangatahi to be themselves and to feel valued and to feel like they belong and they have a space and they can sort of see um, role models. Um, what are the, some of the things you think are important for youth workers or for anyone who works with young people to know when supporting takatapui, rangatahi particularly? Um, and this might, for me, as somebody who uh, firstly is obviously Māori, um, obviously, um, you know, I am also a, a fat person, so that sort of plays into the way that um, I view the world as well. And I've done a good seven years of academic studies into um, Maori history, history of Aotearoa, 
social work, human services, stuff like that. What I would like people to um, know, I guess, is that Māori have come from a place of displacement. And so um, being colonised by another culture has created a culture of Māori <laughs> that um, maybe we assume that the gender roles in Te Ao Māori are the way that they are because of a colonial narrative that was placed upon us. Does that make sense? And so I, I think that there are multiple things that, you know, influence that through colonization. We have things like Christianity and um, faith, which is quite gendered, and that plays a role in the way that we have to portray ourselves um, it plays a role in the way that we move through our lives or expect to move through our lives, talking about like marriage and stuff like that. And so when we consider those things, um, I think that when we're working with Takatapua youth, we have to understand that that's the way that they've been molded um, to live. And, but that might not necessarily be the way that they feel because... I guess it, it becomes a difficult conversation when we're talking about um, brown skin and, and the way that people are treated when their skin is more melanated because, you know, we have racism for people who are, you know, are darker skinned and people who are lighter skinned have a lot more privilege. And so when we're considering intersections of marginal marginalization, like for our Takatapui young people, that really becomes a part of their experience as well. It's like very interconnected. Um, and especially if they're not able to be uh, out, then there's obviously that internalized, you know, um, pressure of dysphoria or, whatever they're experiencing internally as well. If they are sort of out and they maybe can't help but be out, there's obviously gendered um, and homophobic um, experiences that they may possibly go through. And I just feel like there's so many different elements that sort of um, create a specific experience for Takatapu youth, especially. Um, and it's all different because everyone has different intersections, right? You know, there are some people who have disabilities that you can see, but some people have disabilities that um, you can't see. And so those also play into the way that people experience the world and access and stuff like that too so does that make sense it totally makes sense and there's so much in there I <laughs> know well into, this, yeah this is such a huge topic because when you're takatapui it's everything you know it's colonization it's racism it's homophobia it's these gendered expectations it's everything laid on top of each other and the way that you move through the world can really be impacted by your intersections. Totally, yeah. Um, I was thinking of Elizabeth as you were talking because um, this is a resource I was looking for earlier. Um, <laughs> Takatapui part of the whānau is um, sort of something that she put together based on her PhD research and um, really recommend reading this if you're wanting to sort of dig more into um, what things look like. Uh, and she's back. And she's back. <laughs> um, and kind of connections with um, the connections with colonization in terms of how we've ended up where we are today. Um, and so this resource was um, 
really aimed at um, at Fano and at kind of supporting Fano to understand um, rangatahi and I guess um, Takatapui and rainbow people more generally within their Fano. We know from research that Fano is one of the most important things for people's mental health. So um, acceptance from Fano is one of the strongest protective factors that we have and um, where there's kind of rejection or people aren't accepted, that can be one of the, the strongest risk factors as well on the flip side. Um, so there is, yeah, this resource, um, Elizabeth, I was just name dropping you, um, that you produced a few years ago is kind of aimed into that space. And I wondered if maybe Elizabeth, if you'd like to speak to kind of um, any sort of tips or thoughts around working with Fano around um, people who are, around youth workers or people who are working with young people, um, how you might work with their whānau um, who are or aren't accepting of, of their takatākui identity. I think when I'm working with whānau and, and, and the work we do in the community is to always just get back to what is the guts of whānau, uh, the parent's job, the caretaker, the guardian's role to look after their children and their grandchildren, never mind everything else. Never mind what anyone's got to say about it, what's in your heart. And because when they can block out some of those other voices and some of those voices, if, if they're active in their church, especially if it's a more fundamental church, then those are loud voices in the head. And so we try and just say, let's quieten down all those outside voices and say what's important. What do they, and, and quite often, I rely so heavily on our ancestors to guide my work. And so when I'm working with Fano, then I say, what would, what would your mum say? Especially someone's in the past, what would your nana say about this moko? What would your mum say about this moko? And when we've been working with Fano, say, who've been struggling with their child transitioning, even if they're, too, you know, if they're a bit older and now we're getting more and more of our young people identifying as non-binary and, and trans, um, yeah, what would your nana say? What would your nana say about this child and, and what's actually important? Because never mind all of that other stuff. And then it just helps bring clarity because we just have to remember that that's what's going on for them. That all of those voices that say things are wrong and they just bring back to stuff, I love this child. And especially when they say, you will always, I always wait, want to get to a point where they say, I just want them to be happy because that's when we can unveil and peel away not only those voices, but the fears, the fears that they have that this child will not, will get hurt, will get discriminated against. And it's like, yeah, that's a real thing. That's the world and my core thing. And only other people who will have heard me speak, this is a thing I say over and over again, is don't try and hide them away. Don't try to make them be something they're not love them so strongly that they can go out into the world and they can withstand whatever the world will bring. Be that person, be that whanau. Do not let anyone muck with you and your whanau. And so those are the kind of things. Bring up the protective side, bring up the strength and the love. And uh, never mind all those outside voices because how dare they interrupt and interfere with your whanau. Oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Shafonda, do you have any thoughts about that? Someone had a question in the Q&A too around how best to support rangatahi and their whānau if their whānau is conservative and resistant. Oh, well, kia ora, Elizabeth. You, that was really beautiful and, you know, leading by love is just seems like such an obvious thing that we should be doing with our young people and with our whānau especially. Um, sorry, can you repeat what the question was? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted myself and I'd done the opposite, classic Zoom move. Um, yeah, oh. same, same thing really, is sort of how best to support rangatahi in their whānau if the whānau is conservative and is potentially resistant around rainbow stuff, takatapui stuff, gender, whatever it is? Um, so something that um, I have learnt through well, over the past few weeks with um, doing some creating rainbow inclusive school uh, environments, schools, sorry, uh, with Inside Out, um, watching the wonderful Emmett 
um, facilitate those workshops um, is school can be a safe place if home is not um, because young people who are in conservative families sometimes that isn't something that you know uh, they can go home uh, to be in a safe environment um, so if we create a culture at school that is a safe place at least they have somewhere in terms of working with um, conservative family members um, I'm actually unsure because sometimes that is not a safe place for even us as workers to go because sometimes there is resistance. I think it, you know, when we go back to what uh, your organization does more and obviously te whana whana and stuff, it's like a cultural change that needs to happen systemically. Um, because if we kind of go in there and sort of say, well, you know, your politics are wrong and you're harming your child. Um, sometimes that they double down on their politics. Sometimes it means that their child is rejected from the family. Um, and that's not something that we ever want. So it is about um, educating our culture at large, educating our, um, you know, the big organizations that people work for and work with and, it's about especially like individuals calling out homophobia and individuals who are not in the rainbow community being good allies and it's about getting them to speak up against um, homophobia and transphobia as well so sometimes it isn't safe to directly contact that person's family sometimes that causes more harm but it is about um educating on a larger scale i feel like elizabeth would probably have some beautiful corridor about this oh. i think that's a really amazing point around um too though around if if, if whanau or if home isn't safe that um mm. That's so important that other spaces are safe. That like if, if a young person has, doesn't have a safe space at home, if they have got understanding um, adults, people they can connect with at school, whether it's in a, a youth service, wherever it is, um, that's they're going to do so much better. Um, but I think too, like I'm sure I've heard you talk about this before as well, Elizabeth. Is like within Fano Fano is is broad. You know, like if mm. parents aren't accepting, like usually there's an auntie or something. Um, so maybe it's also about finding who that is. Um, Absolutely. Finding someone who can speak up for you when you can't speak is so important. And, and yeah, I always say find the oldest person in your family and ask them to sort it out. But you're right. And, and I want to um, say because of all of you who are watching, I'm sure many of you have organised small groups, have organised big, big organisations and done a, a lot of work is every every safe space you create is is valuable it's saving lives that to be the place when someone can go and just relax and actually we, we um like to the modi it's that thing where your spirit is settled and for lots of us there's very few places where that can be and and and, and the one thing you do, whether it's an hour in your a peer support in your school, uh, whether it's a group in the weekends that meets and does something social, if you can provide that safe space, then uh, every one of those is important as we continue to grow those spaces across our country. Kia ora, thank you. Just had another really beautiful question come through, um, which is around how do you learn from the Tukatapu young people that you work with or work for? What are the insights that you think they share with you? Um, who wants to answer that one first? Okay, I'll start. I'll start the, uh, I learn constantly. <laughs> That's, um, for me, a lot of the work I do with young people is I want to be a strength in their life, I always. I'm, I always say to people, self-care is something I will have to work on, but you need to go to other people for good advice on that. Uh, but being strong, holding your fire, and being able to keep yourself safe in other situations, uh, that's what I can help with. 
And so those are the things I want to do. But what young people do for me is they keep me up to date where things are changing. It's very easy. I'm 55 and I've been working in this for a long, long time. It's It would be easy for me to get set in my ways and say, this is the thing. This is the way to do things. This is the way to be takatāpui. And so what young people do for me is they bring all their joy, all their pain, um, and but their whakaro, their thoughts about what's going on. And when they ask my advice and I can ask these, because there's so many things, I'm like, what's happening? What does this mean? And how does this play out for you? And, and so I think it keeps it keeps me on my toes for sure. Uh, <laughs> and But it keeps me connected in what's happening now so that I never get st- stuck in, in the mud, that I never get too big a head. It helps keep me grounded. And because as I search for advice from my ancestors, then it's it's the young people that really keep me alive, keep me honest. <laughs> Kia ora, that was really wonderful. Um, I think that I learn how, firstly, how technologically incapable I truly am, but... Um, <laughs> I think they have such a breadth of generosity. Um, So a lot of my um, sort of activism online, I engage with a lot of young takatapui folk. And my goodness, they have, you know, they've set up communities and groups. They have, um, they set up crowdfunding. Like they want to give to others. And that is so inspiring. And to think that, you know, we have all sort of fostered our young people in a way that that's the way that they're wanting to engage with <clears throat> their community. Um, it's just really beautiful. I think um, I learn things constantly from young people in general. Um, <laughs> my, you know, my child is 11 and um I'm learning lots from him and his friends and it's really about, you know, what it's going to be their, their world, you know, and, and we get the absolute privilege of watching and supporting and um, seeing our sort of old ways that had kept us in uncomfortable moving into spaces where we as entire people as takatapui as you know like people with different abilities and intersections we get to live comfortably in a world where we're recognized as our whole selves because our young people are making that happen kia ora thank you both for that um it's really beautiful um, we had another question come through, jumping around a little bit, but around what role does tikanga play in the youth sector, in the rainbow sector? How does tikanga play into all of this? Um, Elizabeth, did you have any thoughts about that? Uh, in the youth sector broadly, because I was involved in, oops, excuse me, I just have to. <laughs> As I was saying, the... Um, involved in the youth sector for a long time and so Aratayohi is the peak body for youth development. I was involved in helping to set up and develop the treaty structure for it and and, and the strategic framework for how we would move forward. So I think when, if you're always keeping in mind, remind me of the question again before I just go segue into another story. (laughs) (laughs) It was was a really broad one. It's, yeah, what role does Tikanga play in the youth sector and rainbow sector? Okay, when we set up, so firstly, that's one thing. I think it's really, really critical that if we have um, Arataiohi 
being treaty based that, that they're looking at youth development in a treaty based way and the development of mana taiohi, the um, principles of youth development, which has been fully informed by the research and the actions of, of, of our youth workers and youth development people across the country for the last 20 years. So those that, you know, those are current, that is like right now, tikanga based. So I think those are amazing and incredible things to have as our basis. But also when we started Te Whana Whana 20 years, we wanted it to be a space in which Takatapui, but also other members of the rainbow community could come where Māori could live our culture in a way that honoured our diverse genders, sexualities and sex characteristics. And so tikanga is everything. And at that time, many of us encountered considerable racism within the um, queer community uh, because it was a thing of, oh, well, you're lesbian. Being Māori isn't, isn't as important. You're, um, you're gay, it doesn't matter if you're Tongan or, or you know, any member of our Pacifica migrant whanau. And, and we were like, uh, actually, <laughs> our culture and our spirituality is as, if not more important than, than how we, um, who we love, who we want to share ourselves with and uh, how we identify in other ways. And so we wanted to be a space, a, a sp safe space to start with, but then we reached out into the community over many, many years. And that's what we can say for a long, long, long time now. Nothing happens in the Wellington region without Tifana Fana, but without any group being cognizant, there would be nothing that doesn't start with karakia. There's nothing where those kind of pro basic protocols are just normal part of how we operate. And I think this creates safety for Takatapu and other Māori whānau who come into our spaces. Uh, but it also, it just uh, that foundational understanding of Māori as tangata whenua, but also the beauty and what we can learn from our culture and what we can share. When I travel overseas, uh, because one of the... Uh, the objectives of Tifana Fana is to take the Katapu to the world. And, and part of that is not just to let people know that this is an identity, this is how um, who we are, but also how our culture can inform our lives and the, all those beautiful things around Aroha, Manaki Tanga, um, and, and just the generosity with which we can uh, approach the world despite. The discrimination and hate that we sometimes face that we will look for the love we will look for the strength and um and, and we base up that on our culture on our tikanga kia ora. yeah thinking about um i know we've got some people watching from um sort of mainstream youth organizations and we have have some friends watching as well from um from some of our rainbow organizations um I'm wondering about kind of following on from that, how do our, if you, either of you have thoughts about how our rainbow support sector, how our rainbow youth spaces make more space for Takatapui or how we kind of enact anaki in our rainbow spaces. Um, Sean, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, firstly, um, make connections with mana whenua is really important. Um, making sure that it's not a connection that only benefits you, but is a reciprocal, um, intentional relationship. That's really important. Um, liaise with um, Takatapui organisations um, to make sure that, you know, and whether that's, you know, that should be sort of paid as well, because that is labor. Um, <clears throat> if you are going to be employing takatapui people, um, make sure that they're not the ones who are giving the free PD, <laughs> um, because that quite often happens for us as takatapui people and organizations as we end up being the ones who have to teach everyone else decolonizing sort of methodologies in that field of work um, <clears throat> but that is not that should not be our job um, yeah uh, and does that cover the question 
<laughs> totally, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth, did you have any other thoughts about about that in terms of our yeah, our rainbow spaces and how our rainbow youth workers or organizations um, can make more space for Takatapui? It's an interesting one because I remember when I was first or oh, back in the early 2000s and mid 2000s when say when the first uh, queer youth hui were being held and then uh, helped run the, first, the second kaha. The first one was run by Nathan Brown and the there was a lot of things about giving. I, I created takatapui guidelines for groups. Uh, make sure you do these things. Think about if, you, if you're going to say do it some sort of form of opening because you know the point about karakia is it brings everybody into the space and and it opens up the space and safety so there's lots of ways you can do that it's not about necessarily a christian prayer or even a traditional karakia or incantation it's about performing that right that ritual is the key point so we talked about some of those things because I said if you do that as a normal part then when someone who is takatapu comes into the space that's normal rather than scrambling to think oh god we've got a Māori what are we going to do uh, that's <laughs> never cool uh, but one of the key things we would say and 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 I say this to any organization where I've done treaty work is it has to start way before then who organizes, who decided to have the group, who, what decisions were made, how it would run, when, um, where is it being held, how accessible is it for people. Uh, we, and I'm, I'm just going to bring into here, because so many Māori, we have a huge amount of our people have disabilities, it stands to reason many takatāpū are also going to have di disabilities, along with other people who are from a range of different cultures um, so those basic things there should not be any queer event happening anywhere in this country that is not fully accessible uh, because that affects Takatapu as much as it affects everybody else uh, that the it, it's not necessarily a quick fix some of that is about relationships and if we go back to what Siobhan said about connecting with mana whenua. Now they're really, really busy. What you need to do is develop the relationship so you find out who are their rainbow people, who are their people who care about this stuff, and then that can be the person that you can hook up with. If you're trying to always aim for being in touch with the chairman of the board or the, um, the CEO of, of, of the runanga, you're never getting a meeting. You're, you're just, it's like they got stuff to do. What well, our little groups are doing, it's not their, not their thing, but that's also why you have to try and do as much of the work first, do some reading, talk to the takatapu you know, and then set things up properly uh, so that it's, so just so things flow, so that it's just a normal way of operating and relationship building is key to that. I just want to do a shout out. I know that Aroha Lo is on the on the call right now, who's been, uh, I'm sure there's many takatapu I know on this call, uh, but that Inside Out has, has employed. So when you bring someone in who has the deal, who has connections with the local iwi, then... <sighs> And you can pay them, and I have no idea what you can pay, Aroha. I hope it's, you know, <laughs> the, uh, but that, that liaison person who helps connect you, because it's, it's sometimes it's quite scary to walk up to the mana whenua and go, um, can we talk to you? And especially if you're not Māori and you're not from there, that can be a scary thing. So, you know, reach out to the other takatapu in the community. You're not part of groups, but they, they're, they fuck up up there and, um, and I think generally they're, they're going to be happy to help. So just uh, don't be scared about that stuff. If you think, okay, we're going to do this. We might make some mistakes. We'll apologize when that happens. We all do that. And then we'll just keep rolling. Kia ora. Yeah, I'm thinking um, we're probably heading towards winding up. Um, when, and one of the questions I was thinking towards the end is, um, yeah, we do have a number of um, takatapui who have registered for this webinar and who are on the call. Um, some friends and some names I wasn't as familiar with. Um, I wondered for both of you, if you uh, had the opportunity to say something to your younger takatapui self, um, what would that be? 
and whatever, whatever feels good to share. I can go. Um, I would say that um, it's it's okay to be queer. <laughs> it's okay to be takatapui. Although back then I didn't know the term takatapui because there was not much around rainbow anything when I was a uh, teenager living in good old Blenheim. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to hear that there is, you know, QSAs in those high schools now, but back in the mid 2000s, there, there wasn't. And um, I wish that, you know, I had had the Po Takatapui, like Elizabeth Kirikiri, <laughs> to look up to and be like, wow, I can, you know, I it's safe for me to be who I am. Um, yeah. And also, um, you look really bloody cute as a 15-year-old Siobhan. So, like, don't, you know, don't be so down on yourself because you're actually real hot. So, yeah. I was, I came out when I was young and I was always pretty staunch because I was an activist from when I was young. I was around... Uh, a lot of Māori lesbians and again even for me I was a bit older uh, when I found the term takatāpui uh, but so I was I always saw Māori lesbians then as staunch as leaders in the Māori movement as people who were respected even though there were none that I was aware of where I was in Dunedin I used to hitchhike <laughs> as a teenager to go to dances, women's dances in Wellington and in, in Auckland. Seriously, I would just have money enough to get the ferry and hitchhike the rest of the way to go to a dance so that I could see other Māori lesbians. And so all of those things I was actually called cool as the key thing that I would tell my younger self is that I would find someone to love who would not hurt me and that love didn't have to come with pain and I'm very very thankful that I only had to wait till I was 26 to find that person shout out to my whole wife uh, <laughs> 29 years and counting so yeah that would be the thing because I got into a relationship with a violent woman when I was young and I did extensive counseling over time to be able to pull that apart and there were many times when I didn't think I could go on when that was happening um plus it was life-threatening it was a life-threatening relationship and so that is the main thing I would tell myself that I could do better <laughs> I could it's good people um beautiful strong unconditional love was not far away hang in there stay alive I would also like to say that to myself too because I married a man and that was not that was a mistake and he's you know he has some great qualities he also has some not great qualities but um like com compulsory heterosexuality is dangerous for young people because you know it assumes that you have to hide your identity or the way that you feel on the inside in order to fulfill those expectations but yeah, also, I want to shout out to my beautiful love, Kai, <laughs> um, who I like fell in love with. And then now we've been together for nearly three years. And um, yeah, so anyway, kia ora. Oh, kia ora. Thank you both for, for sharing that. And I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> happy with, happy to see that you're both happy. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's so awesome. Um, I'm wondering um, for everybody on the call, actually, for people who are in rainbow organisations or mainstream organisations or anyone who wants to kind of um, learn more about this or connect more with um, with groups or with kind of takatāpuitanga, um, what are some of the organisations or groups or places you'd suggest that people connect with or or how would you suggest people connect more with this topic? And feel free to plug your own work as well. We can share um, links to 
any kind of websites or resources or whatever um, with participants after this. Um, Elizabeth, oh, okay. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Several of the resources that are available will list all our key organisations. So, um, so some of us that work nationally, like the Tenga Ko Kahukura, Rainbow Youth, uh, Inside Out, us as Te Whana Whana, um, and then regionally based groups like Qtopia, like many, many across the country, is find out, A, find out what happens in your town. And the area that you work, the young people um, that you're working with, uh, what's what's their community and who's around in that? Because sometimes if there might not be a group, but there might be key individuals who, who can come and talk to you, can just have a coffee and uh, go through some of the issues that are facing them. Uh, and if you don't have something, who, who are your best online contacts? Um, and especially some of it is, is about getting education, Thank you. Uh, and learning some stuff, but and sometimes it's about connecting so that you can have when you're faced with a young person that is really, really struggling or in strife, you can say, "Oh, you can ring this person." You can, and even if it's a, a list right in your on your um, notice board that goes, "Okay, for this, I can connect you up. Let's go on their website. Let's have a look and find someone for you to talk to," because someone like me then. You know, I've got this new job, a bit busy, but I will always make time for young people. It is my person who organises my diary because I've had to give up full control of it. Uh, is anything to do with young people is a high, high priority for me. And especially if someone needs to talk uh, and or if they need me to talk to their whanau, I'm always going to do that. But I'm also a little bit busy and so I can't be a, a, a first stop <laughs> kind of thing I'm your last resort if you need someone to come in and slap some you know in a loving and compassionate mana enhancing way but to knock some heads together uh, then I'm good for that <laughs> but um, yeah did quite a few and read our research counting ourselves that research done by shout out to Jack Boone and Jamie Veal just and, and the work that Moira has done, I mean, ridiculous amounts of submissions, papers and that, that we have all written to the United Nations, to our government. Uh, and I'll just say that how disappointed I am and I'll be doing something about it. The fact that there's nothing for rainbow people in this budget is criminal. We fit into other little spaces, but the fact that they've removed the rainbow line that was in the in previous budgets uh, is pretty outrageous. So we'll be following up on that. But uh, yeah, don't make it feel like it's hard. It comes back to that thing about Fano and what's just have going on for that person. Use the principles of mana taiohi because they will help guide. And um, yeah, just... Don't feel like it's insurmountable. It's really, really hard. Just make it simple. Make it about looking after and caring for our young people. And then it's pretty simple what we have to do. Kia ora. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's amazing having you in, that, in those spaces, able to work your influence in those ways. Um, I just wanted to share a comment um, from the chat um, from, from Aroha Lo, um around Kapahaka um, in the kind of suggestion there is to find where you feel good, find the kind auntie, talk with the kui or senior teacher, often to take them to the side works. Um, and it's an issue that needs addressing in lots of different lots of different ways of working around that. Um, yeah, it's a really good, really good practical suggestion. Um, Siobhan, did you have any other thoughts around how people can connect in with Takatapui groups or people or with your work? Uh, Obviously, inside out, um, as, Rain, uh, as Elizabeth Kiriki said. Um, obviously, we are sort of like a nationwide organization. Um, someone also mentioned gender minorities, Aotearoa, um, and ITANS, so Intersex Awareness New Zealand for those intersex folks out there. There's also Outline, um, and they are a uh, rainbow counselling service for um, any aged uh, rainbow people to contact. I think they're between 6pm and 9pm, aren't they? Um, yeah. 
so give them a call if you have any questions and that's for allies as well um, so any questions or you know situations family members or friends etc um, as somebody who you know has lived in Ōtutahi for 11 years um, I didn't really come into any sort of rainbow friends groups until I started to explore my sexuality when I was probably mid-20s <laughs> and then um, I just noticed that there's like a scene of like it's not necessarily people that go out because a lot of queer folk have you know anxiety and <laughs> don't really I mean lots of people party but some people don't want to do that thing but um I don't know we I joined a group who did regular potlucks and that was all for rainbow people and it was so wonderful um and I through that I got to connect with so many different types of people lots of takatapui people um yeah also the art scene is usually filled with lots of rainbow people so if those feel like spaces that you can access safely um I definitely recommend going along to you know there's lots of usually free events um through the arts you know art galleries and stuff like that um go along to those because I can guarantee there will be rainbow people there and um hopefully you know you can make friends or feel comfortable in a safe space and they might even might know you know um other places so like utopia you know who they have young people come in every week um for a group and or for a few different groups and i think that's really wonderful so yeah it's about um getting creative about where you can find spaces that make you feel good <clears throat> I was just thinking about coming back to Siobhan's earlier point about emotional labor is that most of these groups are not funded um, outside of probably Rainbow Youth and, and, and lesser funding to inside out most of the rest have received no regular funding and, and so just be aware to go on the website see what information you can get do some reading so that when you're contacting people you have real clarity about what the issue is so that um yeah people are really stretched and and especially I want to shout out to our intersex Fano. it's it's a condition which is on um one level way more common than than the medical profession would like people to know about but it our activists is so few so few available so I just want to always encourage us who are allies for me as someone who's cisgender uh, and to those of us who yeah just just to remember that as well so think about what what Siobhan said earlier about giving a koha if you're going to speak uh, if you're going to go and have a cup of tea bring biscuits do the thing <laughs> so just just think about what you can provide and about being reciprocal and and taking that advice what can you give to them because things like rather than just asking advice maybe you can pay for them to come and talk to your group and and then they have the opportunity then to spread to share that information to a wider audience um, but then you're supporting them, their ability to actually be able to do that so think about those things before um you yeah before you reach out Kia ora, yeah, thanks for that. That's a really good good reminder and good for yeah for people to be thinking about in terms of engaging with any of our communities, but particularly with with takatapui, with intersex communities, with any of the kind of um, minority communities within Rainbow within the Rainbow, I guess, who tend to not have as much um, resourcing or time and have like so much more demand um, on that expertise because of the um, the important insights and knowledge and wisdom that they have. Um, Probably wrapping up there, kia ora koroa, thank you so much for sharing um, your amazing thoughts and tips and personal experiences as well. It's really beautiful and gave me lots to think about. Um, as I was saying earlier, this is the first in the series. Um, I'll just pop up a little ad for the next one. Um, we've got another session next Tuesday at 11 o'clock, which is with uh, Jelly O'Shea and Joey McDonald. 
um, talking about intersex experiences, about disability, about rainbow issues, and about kind of making connections between those things and across um, across our rainbow sector. Um, so register for that one if you haven't already. Um, there'll be a recording available of today's session, um, which uh, if you've registered today, you'll get a link to that sent through afterwards. Um, so yeah, just want to probably wrap up there and thank you both again so much for your time um, and for everything you've contributed. Um, and we'll just wrap up with a, with a karakia. Uh, karakia tato. Unuhia, uh, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui ki a wātia, ki a māma, te ngākau, te tingana, te wairua i te aratakata. Koi ara e rongo whakaere ake ki runga ki a tīna. Tīna. Huie. Tai. Tai ki e. Kia ora. Thank Kia ora. you everybody. Thanks everyone.